Welcome to The Stumbling Spirit, Contemplations on the Path of Resilience. Whether you realize it or not, you are resilient. It's your birthright. As you take in your next breath, know this truth. It's not only about your capacity to overcome difficult situations, but it's about your courage to do the necessary work to heal, learn, grow, and move forward. What you gain is invaluable wisdom. And it's through these hard stumbles in life that we often discover a new purpose that aligns with our spirit. My name is Fabio Da Silva Fernandez, Reiki master, mindfulness coach, and mystical explorer. Join me weekly as the Stumbling Spirit podcast highlights the lives of extraordinary people like you, sharing transformative stories and beneficial practices of resilience to guide you on your wellness journey. They say that beauty is in the eye of the beholder, but for Leah Morgan, one's image is what leaves a lasting impression. For more than 15 years, she has spent her career helping professionals, from doctors to corporate executives, improve their overall style and boost their confidence through fashion and now the written word. With a background in costume design and image consulting, Leah established a reputation as a go-to men's stylist, working with clients in Canada, and internationally. She has since shifted her focus to professional communications, helping organizations with their online content, documents, and presentations. Today we tackle image and strip back the layers to uncover its meaning and purpose. It's a pleasure to welcome my friend, Leah Morgan, to the show. Hi, Leah. Hi, Fabio. How are you doing? I'm doing well. How about you? I'm doing well. Very happy to be here. We first met in the mid 2000s. I worked in technology, but I had a side gig as a personal shopper. Mm -hmm. You've been in the business of image consulting for many years, 15 years, as I just mentioned. In your view, what is image? Well, image is basically the impression that you make on other people. Okay, it comes in different forms. It comes in visual form and it comes in textual form. Any way that you, you impress on another human being is your image out there. So everything that we that we present to the world, the way that we look, the way we speak, the way we move, the way we write, etc., that causes other people to make impressions of us. All right. So it's sort of like a two-way street. It's about perception. You know, the best thing that we can do as humans is to be mindful of the messages that are coming across from us, right? So so how are we impressing on other human beings? Are we aware? Do we have self-awareness that we're impressing on other people? That's probably the first step is the awareness of how people are perceiving us, because it's very, this is very much about social psychology, I think, when it comes to image. You mentioned awareness. Why is image important? I think it's important because, because we're dealing with human beings and human beings have perception. It matters socially, it matters on an individual level, and it also matters professionally. Everything about us that goes out into the world is going to be interpreted by somebody else, for better or for worse. And however we impress on those people, uh, they will treat us accordingly. You know, some people might say, aren't we playing to human biases? Why can't we just accept ourselves and others as is? Absolutely, of course. And we should do that. However, there are other things at play. People have become a lot more savvy, I think, since the advent of, you know, the internet and, and social media and that sort of things are, well, sometimes you can say it's to not a good uh, extent because some people have become very hyper aware and hyper sensitive about how they come across like influencers, for example, on Instagram, they will only show a certain side of themselves. And we know that human beings, we have lots of sides of ourselves. We, you know, we wake up in the morning and put on sweatpants and our hair is all messy. And that's what happens to everybody. But facing the public, a lot of us put on a different persona because that's what humans do. We are concerned with the way other people think of us, whether we like it or not. I've gotten to the point now where I'm caring less about how other people feel about me because I know who I am. But a lot of people aren't there. And I think, you know, getting back to that self-awareness again, we need to be aware of who we are, how we come across, because other people are going to interpret us and they're going to treat us accordingly, as I said. What is the connection between image and wellness? 
I think there is a big connection, actually, because if you if you are a person who takes care of yourself, for example, you exercise and you eat well and you dress nicely and you present nicely, that's going to do something to your head. That's going to do good things to your head. And part of the reason it's going to do good things to your head is because other people are going to perceive you in a positive light because you have self-confidence, self-respect. And so you do these things for yourself. I take care of myself. I present myself well. That's self-respect. Other people respect people that have self-respect. If you don't have self-respect, your image is going to dwindle, let's just say. People that don't have a lot of self-respect, they don't take care of themselves. They don't eat well. They don't wear clean clothes. They don't, you know, et cetera, et cetera. This gets into mental health as well. But I think that being aware of one's image and presenting it the best that you can can, as often as you can, is probably a good idea for yourself and for other people. You know, my mom used to say that if you're in a bad mood, always look your best. Mm. It doesn't matter if you're in a good mood or in a bad mood, always look your best. But especially mm. when you're not feeling your best, if you look your best, you'll feel better. So I mm -hmm. definitely get what you're saying in terms of that connection of the self-respect, but also the mental health aspect. And there's also a creative expression with this, isn't there? Absolutely there is. Every person is an individual. In the Western world, we are concerned with the individual. And so we want to present ourselves as individuals, many of us, not everybody, but many of us. Me, for example, I was born wanting to present differently, to be creative differently. Like, for example, you know, when you're in elementary school, I remember one day my grandmother had just been uh, to San Francisco and she brought bought me a little cute little red Chinese pajamas. I think I was in grade three or something like that. So I'm like eight years old and it's and it's silk and it's beautiful. I've never seen anything like it. And I wore the top to school the next day and all the girls, oh my God, I love your top. Oh my God. And then I said to them, oh, it's a pajama top. My grandmother gave me a pajama set and I decided to wear the top. Well, guess what happened then? I was shunned. Shunned because I was wearing a piece of clothing that I said was pajama. And as soon as I said that, now it's out of context and it's confusing for people. So I didn't wear it again to school. Let's just put it that way. So for those of us who want to be creative and express ourselves the way we want to, we take a risk. We take a social risk by doing that because so many people are just ready to jump on you. And I guess that has to do with the way they feel about themselves ultimately. But for people that want to feel free to express themselves, we should be able to do that. But we also need to understand that not everybody's going to dig it and that we might get some flack for it. And that's not our problem. That's the other people's problem. If you can't deal with someone who is expressing themselves honestly, you might want to have a little think and wonder why that this is bothering you so much. I'm really glad that you brought that up because there have been many sins of the fashion industry from women's shoes to hiring cheap labor. Mm. And recently there's been a spotlight on hair and what is suitable in the workplace. So mm. what and who determines whether an image is appropriate or not? And how do we reconcile this? Who decides? That's a very, very good question. So I know that there has been a, a lot of talk about black hair in the workplace, women's black women's hair, which is gorgeous. Their braids and their beads and all the things that they do to their hair. Who's saying that this isn't okay? Probably white men are saying it's not okay. It's a terrible cultural fight, really. It's racism. They should be able to do what they want. Why, why shouldn't they be able to carry on their cultural norms? I sat in on a, an anti-racism webinar, and uh, I think that the, a lot of things are extremely unfair when it comes to image and, and when it comes to what is appropriate and what is not appropriate in the workplace. It's going to depend on the, on the culture of the workplace. What do you do? Who are you catering to? What kind of business is it? That kind of thing. But ultimately, I think that we're presently working through that argument. It's come to light. Everyone is aware of it. We are talking about it. Things will change. So as an image consultant, how do you reconcile that when you're working with a client in terms of making suggestions around their dress or how they appear in the workplace? Well, it, it, so it's going to depend on the client and it depends where they work and what they do. 
So I need to find all of this information out. I also need to understand the culture of their workplace so that I can build them a wardrobe that's going to be acceptable in the workplace, but also something that's going to be really great on them, something that's going to make the guy feel fantastic and confident and wonderful because he knows he looks good. Menswear is not complicated. Menswear takes a very long time to change. Basically, men are still wearing the same pieces for the last 200 years, actually, when the sack suit became readily available. And so because men's wear changes so slowly, you know, men aren't going to veer off from a collared shirt. I mean, that's a staple. That's a lot of men's wear are staples. Pieces are staples. Women's wear is completely different because, well, for lots of reasons, but uh, but for men's wear, you, what do you got? You got a shirt, you got a pants, you've got a jacket, maybe you have some shorts, um, socks, underwear t-shirts. It's not complex. It's not complicated like women's wear is. However, simplicity of men's wear is easy to work with in the sense that it doesn't really matter where you work. You're basically going to be wearing the same things. We're going to change things like fit and color and style, but basically it's the same pieces. You're still wearing a pair of pants and that's not really going to change. Of course, when I'm working with a client, I have to understand it depending on his work. Sometimes I've worked with some clients whose bosses hired me to work with their people. And of course, I'm going to listen to what the boss says first, because he's sort of the one calling the shots. And he's the one that hired me in the first place to work with their employee. So I have to take a lot of things into, into consideration. But ultimately, the most important thing is the client. How do you feel about wearing this outfit? How do you feel about wearing these colors? How do you feel in these particular garments? So my goal is to make the client feel as comfortable and as confident as possible. As I mentioned in the intro, your background is in costume design. What got you into image consulting? I've always sewn. My mother taught me how to sew when I was a kid, and I went to theater school. Uh, I have a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree in costume design. So what I was able to do in theater design, it was a really great program, University of Regina, rah, rah. I learned so many things from my program. And what I'm using most in my image work is my understanding of character and how to bring it out and show it via clothing so that other people can read it. So when you're on the stage, or well, not when you're on the stage, when you're watching a stage production and someone walks onto the stage wearing a certain costume of a certain color, a certain shape, a certain period, that's going to do things to your brain. And you're going to think, okay, this person is like this, just the same as image work. We get an impression of that person and we make our decisions about who we think that person is. So the costume designer who did that character's costume did that purposely. That's very much about character analysis and trying to understand who is this person underneath of the words that we see in the text? Who is this person? Let's bring that person out. And so basically that concept led me into image consulting because that that's really fascinating to me. Character is very fascinating to me. Every human being is different than every other human being, even though we're essentially the same. We have different experiences, different perceptions, uh, different backgrounds. All of these things change our perception or, or form our perception. And the way that we see other people it's the character that I find most fascinating that I try to bring out into my clients. So when I went to image school, I had already been doing this for some friends of mine, but I didn't know what it was until I happened to come across something about this image consulting um, course, which I ended up taking. And that just helped me put all of the pieces together. I know that I've got to do the, the character analysis. Okay, cool. Then I'm going to do the, the, the color analysis. Okay, brilliant. There's another piece. Then I'm going to do the, uh, the body analysis. Okay, good. This is going to help me understand what kind of shape I'm working with. Then I'm going to talk to him about his job or his life or whatever and find out, okay, well, what are the best pieces for him that are going to be the most comfortable and the most that are going to look the best on him and also what's going to be the most appropriate you know getting back to your question about a workplace and so it's kind of like that it was a strange bridge to cross I don't know if anyone else in the world has done this but essentially it is the character of the client that is carried over into image work and we work with him through his character there's a real artistry to determining that character and also in figuring out the uniqueness of your clients. I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit more about that. 
When I work with a client, the first thing that we do is I send him a 30 question profile so that I can try to understand who he is as character. Now, these questions are formulated from theater school and also from image school. So from theater school, I, I'm essentially doing a character analysis on his play. The, the, the profile is the play, which I never got. So I need to glean as much information from the profile as I can to build what I think is his true self. So there's all kinds of questions in there. There's there's questions about his work, uh, about how he spends his time, what kind of music does he listen to, what's his favorite movie, what was his childhood like, uh, you know, what are your plans for the future, blah, blah, blah. Some of the questions are visual. So I'm asking about art because I also want to understand the way a client perceives things and what kind of patterns and colors appeal to his eye. And there's all of these things. I'm, I'm putting all of these eggs in a basket and, I, and I'm going to make a beautiful omelet in the end. I always tell my clients, you don't know me very well yet, but I want you to be spend as much time writing and, and answering my questions as you feel comfortable, because the more I know about you, the better product we're going to have in the end. And then we just sort of go from there. And through this process, is, which is another thing I wanted to mention, is that the client gets to trust me. And he gets to understand my perception and what I'm looking for and why I'm looking for it. And I think that makes him comfortable. I, I always make eye contact with my people. I try to meet them in person when I can and have a human connection because this is a very personal work. Why did you choose to work exclusively with men? I have always worked with men. I have always had more male friends than female friends. Always my whole life, my entire life, I'm usually the, the female that hangs around with the gang of guys. And it's always been like that. In fact, you have been in that gang sometimes, Fab. I don't know. I just have this natural, I don't know, affinity, I guess, for, for men. I, I, I communicate well with men, I, which doesn't mean that I don't like women, of course. Don't, don't think that. But I just get along really well with men. And uh, I like working with them. I love men's clothing. I have a long history with men's clothing. I like to also try to understand what it is, what it's like, if I possibly can, to be a man. What is the masculine condition? I have a very, I have a lot of interest in this, and I've done a lot of research and study over the years to try to understand them from as many different angles as I can, including psychology. What is it like to be a man socially? What kind of social expectations are put on them? I mean, I'm just trying to trying to understand what it is to to be a man in this society now so that I can be more empathetic towards the client and help him on his way. Everything is about understanding the character. So as much as I can, try to understand what kind of a life or what is life to him? What is life like? What is society to him? Do you have any highlights from your career as an image consultant in terms of success stories? Lots of them. I got to say first, image work has been so very gratifying for me from the get-go. In order to help people be better and be happier in life is such a blessing. I am so fortunate to be able to do this for people. I've helped men get really high level jobs at universities and in hospitals. I've helped them find partners. I have helped them just be better generally, be more confident generally. There have been, I mean, everybody comes to me for, usually for a specific reason. Some of them, sometimes it's for, uh, you know, I've got a job interview. Sometimes it's like, I want to meet more women or I want to meet more men or whatever it is. And essentially, whatever their goals are, I'm trying to help them meet those goals with their image. And sometimes it's not only the way that they look, sometimes it's the way they behave, which is also a part of your image. So for example, I have a client in a different province who works in the medical profession who will get in touch with me from time to time because he's giving a presentation or he's hosting something or you know something like that. And he's just, can you help me with my, you know, what do I do? What do I say? What do I do with my hands? You know, kind of thing. And, and so I'm absolutely totally open to that as well, uh, because your image is about the way you look, the way you communicate and the way that you behave. And it's ultimately behavior trumps everything. 
I really like it when these clients come to me and say, to Leah, I need you to help me coach or coach me through this, whatever difficulties I'm, I'm having, uh, because I, I, I need some support. And so, and that's a massive compliment for me because I'm always, I'm always happy to help. And for someone to ask my opinion like that is, is really special. Well, that's a perfect segue because you have pivoted your focus to professional communications. Why did you yes. choose to make that move? Well, you know, you remember the pandemic? The pandemic affected every person on the planet. And for me, what happened when the when we went into lockdown? Well, nobody was caring about their image very much when they were all locked inside their house. <laughs> you know, we were all wearing sweatpants and trying to remember to brush our teeth every day. So things kind of simmered down to, to the point where I, I got to do something else because I'm not getting, I can't support myself. In fact, I remember when, when we first went into lockdown, it was in March of 2020. And I was just starting the best year I had ever had in as an image consultant. And uh, when everything shut down, because everything shut down in Europe first, and I remember I had just ordered these custom shoes for a client from Spain. And I was really upset because Spain went into lockdown. I think one of the first countries that went into lockdown, like, oh my God, what am I going to do with my client's shoes? And I was very upset about it. You know, eventually things obviously worked out uh, with the shoe, but it hit the fashion industry really hard hit the textile industry really hard. We're bouncing back now, but things are in a different form now. Things are in a different form. Men are not wearing ties. They're not really wearing suits. They will come to me, even if it's just an inquiry, Leah, I don't know what to wear anymore because it's confusing now. Everything is different now on the other side. So anyway, ultimately, to get back to your question, image consult, image work dried up pretty much. And, I, and so I went to work in film in, in costume. And I did three jobs there for nine months because that's my background. And, and I realized, I don't think I want to do this. I want to do something else. So I decided I'm going to be an editor. I had been uh, working in the publishing, I guess you could say, industry for about 15 years. I've been an editor. I've been a writer. I've published extensively. I have a lot of skills when it comes to communication. So when I decided to make that shift, this was in 2021, I had a lots and lots and lots of articles published in major Canadian uh, media. I had spent, uh, I was the editor and in-house editor at a not-for-profit and I'd done all of these things and I had, I had this, uh, the experience already, but I thought, you know, I'm really interested in just communication, clear communication. And, and it's very similar to image work in the sense that it's, it's a message that we're getting across, whether it's a visual message or whether it's a written message or, or something on a screen, something visual on a screen. So it's essentially the same thing because no matter matter how you're, whatever you're giving out, whether it be visually through your behavior, through something you've written or through a website that you host or that you have created, that's going to make impressions on other people. So all of this is the same. It's just a different channel. It's a different communications channel, but essentially it's basically the same thing. I gave you the example of what it's like. So Everyone knows what it's like to go out onto the street and you're looking at other people and you see someone that's in, I don't know, clothing that you don't think looks very good on them. And so we judge and that's what human beings do. And we do this naturally. And you can say, I don't like being judgy, but you're still going to do it because our brains do that. If I'm reading an article, if I start reading an article and I see mistakes in syntax, there's grammatical mistakes. There's a misplaced period or something like that. I'm going to say to myself, what is this crap? Who wrote this? And then I won't read the rest of it. It's basically the same thing. You get one chance to make a first impression. No matter what your message is or where your message is, you get one chance. So if you're a writer and you've not done a good job communicating your point, people will not read it. And just the same, if you go out somewhere and you're dressed inappropriately or you haven't made an effort, you haven't you're not in clean clothes, anything like that, people will say, next, I don't want to talk to this guy. He looks like he's not making an effort, so why should I? But it's basically the same thing. We're making an impression on another person, and that person is going to deal with us accordingly. I worked in the corporate world for many years, and I've seen both sides of the spectrum. I've seen professional and unprofessional communications. In mm -hmm. your view, what are the essential building blocks to effective communication? 
I think that a person needs to be very clear on what they're trying to say, for one thing. They also need to do it with brevity. I don't think anybody likes to sit there reading a bunch of words that don't mean anything. Get to the point. The whole, you know, I'm a big supporter of plain language, and plain language is about getting to the point and not using, you know, long phrases when you could use one word, a simple word. We're constantly evolving. And so when we think about the human mind and the internet and how fast the internet is changing, even if you're, you know, even something like Facebook or something or some sort of a social media, they're changing their platform like every six months. And so we constantly have to adapt to, oh, how they change this. Well, how do I do this now? And it's constant. We also have to remain aware of the amount of messages that are hitting us constantly. As soon as we turn on our computer, we have to decide what we're looking at. What do we want to spend our time looking at? And probably we're going to spend our time looking at things that are not wordy, that are to the point, that give us the information that we're looking for quickly. Getting back to the plain language idea, as far as I'm concerned as an editor, the fewer words that you can use to convey your message, the better, because people have a shorter attention span. Even grammar is changing. We're no longer using dashes anymore, for example. So if you say up to the minute, which used to have dashes in between each word, we don't do that anymore because the eye drags on them. So this is about speed. So we need to, you know, when we're writing and we're editing, at least me, I like to use the least amount of space with my words as possible while conveying the same message clearly and concisely. You mentioned communicating in a very concise way. What are the other blind spots that you notice in communicating professionally? Layout is something that, that I'm always very aware of. I do layout. Do you remember the old days of, uh, remember when we all started doing websites 15, 20 years ago, remember? That? And it was just a bunch of clunky junk and, you know, brash colors all over the place. And so some, some of those websites still exist. They're old, but so sometimes when you go, when you find these websites that are old and clunky, you just go, whoa, I'm so happy we have evolved in our communications because there's so much to look at on this page that I don't think I can. I, so I think I'm going to go somewhere else. You have to have enough white space around things. You can't have too much clutter. Don't use 10 different colors because you're, tr you're, you're not trying to confuse the reader. You would like the reader to go straight to your point and understand what you're talking about. Not having to go through, you know, reams and reams of, of text. Academic ed editors and writers, they that's very wordy and that's the nature of academia. But for the rest of us who aren't in academia, maybe we're in business or, you know, something like that. Business people don't have a lot of time. We need to get to the point straight away. What are examples of the types of copy that you do? So I write articles and I write web content and uh, business materials and things like that. And I also edit professional articles and web content and, and all the rest. And so what I like to do is I like to work with business because that's sort of where I come from. Small business, I like to support small businesses. I like to support or work with professionals. I'll give you an example. I, I work with a lawyer who uh, I do, I edit her articles that go into a, a lawyer's publication. And it's really interesting because I get to learn so many things from my clients. She does uh, legal AI legal tech, which is, what do I know about legal tech? Nothing until I get to read her articles and edit. And, and the joy of doing that is I get to learn new things about things I wouldn't normally be able to learn about. And I am privileged to take my client's work and pare it down and mold it into something that is going to be really, that's really going to catch the reader's eye. It's going to help the reader go through the read smoothly, hit all of the points and uh, ultimately make the writer look brilliant. That's what editors do. Before you take on a client, do you assess the corporate culture to figure out how to write copy for them? What's your approach? First, I tend to work with small businesses, not corporations. And this is sort of its own niche, I suppose, in it, in itself. For example, the small businesses that I do work with, it's, it's a one-person show. 
So I don't have to talk to HR and I don't have to go through those channels. I can talk to the individual, the owner, and talk to them about their profession, which I suppose is uh, similar to, to corporate because you have to sort of understand the same things, but there's less, uh, there's more freedom with a small business owner. What kinds of organizations do you work with? I work with lawyers and real estate people and other small business owners. You know, the the term imposter syndrome, this is the term that the that the editors use a lot because I think all editors feel the imposter syndrome. I certainly do. Even though I've been I've got 15 years of experience, only in the last few years have I joined a professional association and I sit on the board actually, but I don't have a university degree in editing, right? So this is where the the imposter syndrome comes in. But then I will talk to my association and I'm explaining this to her and she said, "Yes, everybody has imposter syndrome. I like that you have imposter syndrome because this means that you don't have a big fat ego. No, I don't have a big fat ego, but uh, there's that kind of fear. And it, it, she sort of made me see the light and said, Leah, you don't need a university degree in editing. You can have a university degree in something else and still be a good editor. What I do at my association, I have I belong to two associations and they both of them have really excellent training opportunities for members. And so I've done a lot of those and I've learned a lot of things. I'm going to the Editors Canada conference in June, which I'm really excited about. The the editors are absolutely lovely, lovely people. I love working with them. I love being a part of their professional group. All of us are in it for the same thing helping the client express themselves well. And you've had a lot of experience with writing. I mean, you've written for Globe and Mail, the Toronto Star, Huffington Post, Toronto Life, and that's the foundation for you to start this venture, is it not? Yeah, exactly, yes. So I guess it was in the early 2000s, I started a men's blog and I did a heavy amount of research on my blog. I would do heavy research on my articles and I'm very fortunate to have been published widely in Canada, really, really fortunate. So I was lucky enough to submit articles. I had almost every one of my articles published, and I am a very, very fortunate writer to have that happen. What I would do with my articles is that I would self-edit so that the editor that I sent it to had less work to do on my work. So most of the stuff that I submitted that was published was really lightly edited for style. So I'm very, very fortunate that I was able to do that. So I love writing. I love to edit as well. Uh, and so when I'm writing, I'm doing editing and writing at the same time. So I get a nice piece at the end. And, you know, having worked with different editors at different publications, that was also really a really good experience because they were very, very helpful, very supportive, and they gave me feedback. And I learned so much from them. And I just got really interested in cleaning up other people's work, essentially, is, is what editing is in a way. And uh, I really like helping writers. I really like helping other writers find their voice and find their points. And it's very, uh, it's very gratifying. Apart from the obvious career shift, how have you evolved as an image consultant? I think that I am uh, a better judge of character than I ever have been. I'm able to recognize in other people that we're all at where we're at. If people want to change and look a different way, that's where I come in. But I, but I also understand that not everybody's into it. I think that I have become more empathetic and respectful of other people through my work because I've heard so many stories from so many clients and everybody comes from a different place and everybody has a different perception. The, the career has been very rich in understanding the human condition, which is really fantastic for me because I find it really fascinating. I think also as an image consultant, I have learned, and this is through my own closet, my own wardrobe, I have learned to pare down, and this is like editing, it's editing my closet. I just I just changed my closets over a couple of days ago. It's kind of like editing, editing words. I like to get out the editing machete and pare down that text until we get to the point. And it's kind of doing the same thing to your closet. So in my case, I know what my color palette is, and my closet's filled with my own colors, which is good, but not always. And so just pulling out, paring down, get rid of the stuff that doesn't have any place anymore. 
it's basically the same thing as editing. So these two, I think, work kind of in tandem. But I think that I've grown as a human being, having been an image consultant and just listening to other people and just being a good listener and not being a dictator is wonderful. And it's just like, I think anybody that works, anybody else that works with a human being like you, we're going to get so much information from our clients that's going to help us grow, I think, as human beings, as well as helping them grow as human beings. What is your intention for your businesses going forward? I am still taking image clients, but I'm not being as proactive with a promotion. My website exists. My LinkedIn profile exists. I exist. The services still exist, but I'm kind of shifting my focus to writing and editing because I think I see a brighter future there. I love my image work, but you know, we're talking about resilience. One of the things about resilience is that you have to understand when it's time to say, okay, it's time to move on, or it's time to say no, you know, being true to yourself, you have to be true to yourself. So I think that from my point of view, I've made this shift because of basically what the pandemic did to the business. And I, I don't know what's going to happen to it. So I need some stability. And, and I'm finding a lot of stability in, in editing. And I'm also finding a lot of stability in the associations that I belong to and all the people, the, the new editing friends that I've made. And the editors love to help. And they're always there to support you. And everybody wants to help everybody else out. And it's really lovely. The fashion world can be like that, but it also can be something very different. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, I'm basically doing the same thing. I'm just doing it in a different form. What advice do you have for someone who is considering an image tweak or overhaul? I think it's a good idea to first come to terms with the fact that it's time for you to change. Men don't really like to change that much <laughs> in general. There's always exceptions to the rule. but and, and I think a lot of the time clothing is just something that, oh, I have to wear it. I have to put something on. I don't think a lot of men are, are necessarily focused on what they wear. Maybe they don't care and that's okay. Uh, but for the men who do want to change, I think it's good to understand why you want to change, what you want to get out of the change and how you want to do it. My process is quite involved. It's very, very thorough. I'm not just a stylist. I'm going into the character. I'm going into the science of your color work. I'm going into your body and analysis. I'm going into your wardrobe analysis. I'm doing a pull for you at the store. I'm essentially curating a wardrobe for you that's going to suit you on all levels that, that you've told me about in your profile. But having a point, like not just, eh, I think I feel like getting some new shirts. That's that's a shopping trip. That's not a, an image work. Image work goes deep down to your core and you have to be ready for that. Not everybody's going to be into that. And I recognize that. But for the men who do go into it, it is extremely rewarding. You mentioned letting go or knowing when to let go and knowing when to say no as examples of resilience. What other insights do you have on resilience? Well, it's the ability to recover from hardships or setbacks. And how, what does that look like? I think that that can be on a mental, an emotional, or a physical, or a financial level. Like I said before, we have to know when it's time to walk away. We have to know when it's time to say no. And it's okay to be a quitter, everybody. You can walk away from things if it suits you. Don't ever think that I'm not a quitter because people tell me I'm not a quitter. You want to walk away from something that's not working for you? Walk away from it because you're the most important thing here not other people's expectations, you. Also, I was thinking about resilience in the sense of uh, like a piece of fabric. And so what we think about when we're thinking about a piece of fabric, does it have elastic recovery? Can we pull it out and will it return to its original shape? That's also being resilient. So I think that that means not, not letting the bastards drag you down. We all take everybody else's opinions to heart. That's kind of what happens. It's unfortunate, but we do. So we have to be able to bounce back to who we were in the first place. It's about being adaptable because we have to adapt to new circumstances and circumstances are changing all the time from day to day, moment to moment. And we have to change our mind. We have to make decisions about things all the time. And I think that that's part of being resilient is being flexible, you know, saying, 
okay, it's time for me to change my career or, or change my partner or change my living space or whatever it is. It's okay to do that. If that's what you need to do, go do it. Don't wait for other people to say, oh, I don't know, I think that you should do this, or I think this is a bad idea, or I think this is a good idea. What does it mean to you? Because no one is you. You have your own perception. So no one to walk away, no one to change, and no one it's time to adapt to something else. What are your practices of resilience? I like to take care of myself. So I started doing yoga almost every day. So that helped me immensely, immensely. It is medicine. Physically, I feel great. I'm very, I'm strong and it helps me navigate the world in a much more gentle way than I used to. So that I think is, is part of it. Also just being realistic and adapting, like I said earlier, being mindful is so, so important for, for this. Being mindful of what you're going through, be mindful of how far reaching is this problem or this setback that, that you're dealing with. You have to be able to be flexible. How do these practices benefit you? You mentioned yoga and you mentioned mindfulness. How do they benefit you? Like I said, the yoga is yoga makes me feel good physically. And when I do yoga, my head is different from when I started. When I first got on the mat, my head is different when I get off the mat. It gives me a more positive outlook on life. It just sort of gives me a happier mindset. Uh, and, and there's science behind this. I can't explain it to you, but there is science behind it. It's about your brain chemicals and what yoga releases. And that's really good. I'm also very flexible, strong. I feel really good. And then being mindful. I think everyone should be mindful all the time if you can, because being mindful, I mean, we'll just take a basic example. If you're walking down the street and you've got your cell phone and you're just looking at your cell phone and you're walking down the sidewalk, you're not going to see the uneven sidewalk ahead of you and you're going to trip over it because you're not paying attention. You need to pay attention to the world around you. What is going on? What's the traffic doing? What are these people doing? What's happening? You have to be aware of that for safety issues, if nothing else. Being mindful will just, it just puts sort of, makes everything click, I think. How can people contact you if they want to reach you? People can reach me at leah at transformyourself.ca if you're interested in having a chat about your image, gents. And if you are interested in writing and editing services, you can get in touch with me at leah at polishedcopyediting.com. Thank you so much, Leah. I really appreciate your time. Thank you for sharing your insights and for sharing your story. Thank you, Fab. It's been great. Always happy to help. Thank you for listening to The Stumbling Spirit, Contemplations on the Path of Resilience. This is Fabio Da Silva Fernandez. Join me again next week for another episode of transformative stories and beneficial practices to guide you on your wellness journey. If you wish, you can follow and DM me on Instagram at The Stumbling Spirit. Until next time, take a deep breath and another step forward on your path of resilience. Hey!